Welcome uh, to a session on how to dress for winter in Saskatchewan, uh, particularly if you're going to be outside and be active. So thank you for joining me. My name is Dwayne Bandman. I just want to uh, acknowledge that we, Saskatchewan Polytechnic, is situated on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the ancestral lands of the Cree, Salto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota peoples, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, today was supposed to be snowshoeing day. Uh, at some point, somehow we'll organize something again. Uh, if you are from the Regina campus area, uh, please reach out to me. I've got snowshoes that I can lend you and uh, you can have some fun also skis and boots and poles. Uh, but today we're going to talk about um, how to dress for a day like today uh, for snowshoeing or skiing. Uh, so if we were going to go outside today, this lecture really should have come first and then we're all prepared. So um, I'm going to, I think I've got six solid tips that I'm going to go through and I've got some props and some, uh, some demonstration pieces that I want to show you. And uh, I'm planning on maybe uh, giving you some information for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then I can turn the recording off and we can open this up to Q&A uh, because what I'm going to describe to you, there's, there's more to it than this. Uh, and also you might have a different experience, things that you've tried, things that haven't worked. What else can you do so we can have a discussion at the end of it? All right. So uh, the, the topic here, I think, is really important for anybody who lives in Saskatchewan, because I don't think it's reasonable to just stay inside for six months. That's a long time. And uh, it's not healthy for us physically or mentally. And then the flip side to it is getting outside in the cold, even if it's even if it's very uncomfortable, I will I say this all the time. It's easier than you think. Uh, so I, just to give you a little bit of background, um, have tried to learn as much as possible over the last thirty years when it comes to how to enjoy the outside and be comfortable. I bike outside uh, twelve months of the year. I run outside twelve months of the year. Um, I I compete and race in biathlon. I've done that for several years, and that's probably upped my understanding of how to survive in the cold more than anything, because uh, that's a sport that we're limited to wearing gloves. We can't wear mitts for shooting. Um, so how do you keep your fingers warm if you can't wear mitts? Uh, that's, a, that's a trick. So, so I've also, I've done a lot of things wrong. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've injured and damaged a lot of things on my body. So, so I would just say that uh, getting out and experiencing the cold is not about toughing it out. It's not about freezing yourself and then surviving um, at all. This is about preparing. So, you know, when I bike to work on a day like today, when it's minus 20, um, <clears throat> I'm not toughing it out out there. I am comfortable and warm and toasty and everything's fine. I'm just like you in your car. I'd argue I'm actually more comfortable than you in your car. All right, so <clears throat> let's get to this. Uh, weather tip number one, base layers. That's very important. Your base layers um, are like the, the, the shirt that you've got on top and the, and the, the long underwear or the tights that you've got on your bottom. Um, that's uh, a critical piece to this. Uh, and I'll say all six tips are critical. So this is the first critical piece to this. So <clears throat> demonstration number one. So obviously, you know, nothing rocket science-y here. Um, long sleeve shirt, right? And then uh, full length tights. <clears throat> so here's my underwear display, okay? That's, uh, that has to go on first. And here are the characteristics that you need for that to work. It has to fit snug. It has to fit against your body, form fitting. Um, that's key. Insulation, just like with your triple uh, pane windows in your house or the pink insulation that goes into the walls of your house, insulation is about preventing airflow. And so like a shirt like I'm wearing now, if it's loose and air can go in and out, that takes all my heat away and that's when I get cold. So your base layer has to be tight fitting. Um, what should it be made out of? I'm going to say almost anything except cotton. All right. For anything that's going to be outside in the cold, uh, skiing, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, 
cotton should not be anywhere near any part of your body. Not cotton, all right? Um, I'd say the number one choice would be wool. Nice merino wool. The base layer is not thick. It's a thin layer, but wool is the best at insulating and, and keeping, um, kind of trapping warm air near your body. The nice thing about wool is if you do end up sweating, um, I think if it's, I think the number is like, if, if it gets really wet because you're sweating, it still um, kind of maintains your heat up to 80% of what it would normally if it was dry. Whereas a polyester doesn't have that same capacity. So wool is the best, um, but like these tights that I just showed you, that's 100% polyester. Um, the reason I like those for biking is uh, they're a lot more durable. So with my legs rubbing against the seat, my wool tights are, are shot in a year, whereas these tights will last forever. So, um, so not cotton, no cotton, either something like a wool or a polyester, it has to fit relatively tight. So that's the trick, number one, uh, for your base layers, okay? Uh, let's see, <laughs> number two, cover everything. So one of the mistakes that a person can make is they wear a really big thick um, winter coat and a headband with the top of their head showing, okay? Um, or their neck is exposed, okay? This might sound funny, but a thicker toque can make your hands warmer, okay? The, so normally, normally when we go outside, the parts that get cold the first are the hands and the feet. And it's because they're built like radiators, right? They're perfect for freezing in the cold. Um, it's not like a seal flipper that's one piece, right? We've got all these digits hanging out and they, they cool really quickly. Um, so a big mitt works, right? But maybe you are doing something where you want gloves because you're, I don't know, fiddling with kids' skates or skis or boots or doing something maybe on a, on a vehicle outside and you need your fingers to function, uh, wearing a toque prevents heat from escaping through your head. And that heat can then be used later to um, keep your fingers and toes warm. So things like, uh, I'll be right back. Just getting some more props here off the rack. So for example, you've got that neck hanging out, right? And so one of my favorite items of clothing is a buff. Now buff is an actual brand. Um, I guess these, this tech typically would just be called a neck, a neck tube. Okay. So you could, if it's stretchy enough, you can wear it on your whole body possibly. Right. Um, so this, when you see the diagrams, this can turn into all sorts of configurations for your head, but the idea is that it covers your neck and then you've got the option as it sits kind of around your throat, you can also just quickly pull it up over your mouth, your nose, okay? Uh, so this kind of covers the throat area and then a proper toque. And honestly, it doesn't have to be like a thick toque. Maybe it's just something thin, okay? Uh, so this is a nice, a nice icebreaker wool toque, super thin. This is like t-shirt thickness. And uh, this is all I wear underneath my helmet for biking. So, but it, it provides that kind of insulating layer um, to prevent my heat from going away. So covering everything, um, is a, is a key. Uh, so you might have, uh, maybe you've got tights or pants that kind of go down to your ankle and, and they're snug and you put your running shoe on, maybe you're going for a run and there's that, there's that little kind of half inch gap between the pant and the shoe where that's just your sock showing. It's just that part of your ankle. Well, that little, that little window will lose heat that heat we really want to save to keep our toes from freezing. Because if you're just wearing running shoes for a run and it's minus 20, um, <clears throat> your feet can get cold. So uh, taking like an ankle gaiter. So just a nice, uh, uh, gaiters are things that wrap around your ankle and calf, normally for bushwhacking or heavy duty hiking. But you get the little ankle gaiters that just cover your ankle. And now it prevents snow from getting into your shoe, which is handy and also prevents that heat from dissipating out. That's the key. Any bit of heat you've got, you really want to hold on to. So cover everything. All right. Uh, number three, uh, weather tip number three is uh, now that you're outside, you need to get moving. One of the biggest 
survival pieces to surviving being outside is move. At the beginning, when you step out the door and start, things can feel tingly and cold, but your own like walking, running, skiing, snowshoeing, that movement will create heat. And that's the heat that's going to keep you um, happy and survivable out there. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a little trick. So when you uh, put all your gear on, wait in the house for like five minutes, right? Just kind of hang out with all your gear or maybe even do like five push-ups in all your gear or five little kind of body weight squats in all your gear. Preheat yourself, okay? Get that blood flowing so that when you go out, now you actually feel comfortable, all right? Um, <clears throat> that's, uh, so your average person, uh, you know, it's going to work in the morning, and crawls out of bed, has a cup of coffee, puts their biggest jacket on, walks out to their car, right? Trying to move as little as possible, sits in their car and they're uh, freezing to death, right? And they start the car and it's not warming up very fast and they drive to work freezing. And then they go past the biker on the road thinking, oh my goodness, that person must be freezing to death because I'm so cold. No, the cyclist is actually nice and warm because they're moving. You're cold because you haven't moved. So there's that. Uh, now, if you're on that topic, though, you can, uh, I would suggest practicing with experience. If it's really, really cold, sometimes your body will go through a little bit of a, a cooling phase before it actually warms up thoroughly. So for example, if I go for a run and it's minus 25, I know that at the 10 minute mark, my toes are probably going to feel frozen and my fingers are going to feel frozen. They're, they're going to feel cold. They're not actually frozen because that's dangerous, but they feel cold and uncomfortable. And I know that if I just keep moving another five minutes or so, maybe 10 minutes, the blood flows out to them and they start to thaw and warm up and feel good. Um, so I know that works for me and I can just run out in a straight direction and I'm okay. All right. Now, for yourself, if you've never experienced or practiced that before, um, I would not suggest just running five kilometers in one direction and hoping it works out, but rather maybe just run around your block, okay? Or walk around your block. Stay close to home so that if all of a sudden it feels uncomfortable, it's like, you know what? My fingers are freezing. I don't like this. You can just go inside, all right? And then you can try again the next day. Um, so slowly experience experiment with how this is going to work without putting yourself in a dangerous situation. All right. Again, uh, with a little bit of practice, you'll find out that it's easier and more comfortable than you thought. All right, cool. Uh, uh, weather tip number four. Again, we're talking about, you know, oftentimes the toes and fingers freeze. Avoid clenching your hands. Okay. In fact, avoid clenching anything okay this whole this whole position just tightens things which means the blood which is hot can't flow to the extremity and uh and then it's getting even colder okay now if you are if you do feel like shivering then shiver away because that's your body's mechanism to create heat don't stop the shivering let the shiver happen okay all right so but with the hands um if you end up uh you know doing a buckle on a snowshoe or having to open a gate or do anything with your hand where you have to squeeze that. Okay. What you've just done, like, uh, like your washcloth, if you, you've wrung all the blood out of it, you've squished all the blood out and now it's cold. Okay. Uh, you need to get blood back into that piece. So it feels warm. So, uh, in biathlon, you'll see us with our fingers outspread and we just kind of do this, uh, shoulder shrug up and down thing. Okay. That really kind of pumps the blood from our core down our arm into our hand. Okay. We'll also do this. It's kind of like if you've got, uh, I don't know, a bunch of goo on your hand and you are trying to like, you're trying to get it off. The hands are completely open, completely relaxed. And I'm just pushing blood into my hands. All right. This is what you do. If your hands are getting cold now, if you've waited a little too long and your hands are really cold and you're trying not to squeeze them, but, oh, you want to so much, but instead you're thinking, well, I'm going to try that stupid thing that Dwayne showed me where I shake my hands out. 
this is what's going to happen. You're going to start to shake it and they're going to feel colder and colder and colder. And you're going to wonder why isn't this working? The reason they're feeling colder is your hands got cold, then they got numb. And as they start to warm up, you start to feel them more, except they're not that warm yet. They're still cold. So the fact that they're feeling colder means your feeling is coming back. That's a good thing. Keep doing it. They will start to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And again, the heat is made by your muscle activity. So as you're doing this, you may continue to walk. You may continue to run. You may just jump up and down and get more heat going. But that's the trick to getting your hands back to normal temperature. And avoid the squeeze, the squish, the ooh, that part. That just shuts the blood down. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, weather tip number five. Protect the face. Uh, it's very easy for us to put a toque on our head, maybe a buff around, and, and dress perfectly like I've just described. But you still have your cheeks. You still have your nose. Um, and inevitably, um, if you're born and raised here and you've been outside a few times, you've probably frozen your cheeks or your nose. You don't want to do that. It's very bad for your skin, uh, from an aging perspective, uh, from, a, if it freezes once, it'll freeze more likely that whole winter. So, um, <clears throat> a couple tips here. And so I'll share, I'll share the best one that I just figured out this year. Um, I used to, I'd watch the Olympics and I'd watch the skiers on TV and they always had like tape across their cheek and I always thought man what's this magic anti-frostbite tape that these Olympians have um, what they're using is just k-tape the physio k-tape you can buy this at a at a any uh, pharmacy typically uh, it's called k-tape or luco luco tape okay so this is the tape that you'll see on on athletes or people you're watching on tv you know there'll be a big strip across the shoulder on a basketball player or a strip across the knee for a, for a runner. Uh, it's, it's therapy tape to help with physical injuries, um, but it's cloth-like and it's almost insulating. Um, it's also designed to stick to skin and it's also designed to come off without taking your skin off. So it's really good. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll cut a piece that fits my nose, right? And then I just stick it on my nose and now I can bike with my nose exposed um, but it's not going to get, it's not, the surface of my skin isn't touching the air. And you can also cut a piece and bring it across your cheek. And then you'll look like those cool athletes on TV. So you can cover your face with that K-tape and uh, it protects the, that skin from freezing. Okay. Um, I did not bring one of my uh, balaclavas that just have the eye holes in the mouth hole. I'm not actually a fan of those, but they do work. Um, like I described with, uh, um, with the buff, um, so, you know, the toque goes on your head and, and comes down to your eyeballs, right? And uh, so this is kind of what I would recommend. This is one recommendation if you're going for a jog or a hike and, you, and it's like minus 45 and you're not sure if you should be out there. Um, so then I got the buff and I'll take the buff and I'll just, I'll just pull this in front of it, All right? Get that up. So I've just got, oops. So I've just got my like eyes showing through, right? Um, and then the, my, the breath actually kind of, your eyes don't freeze because the breath coming out of your mouth is actually thawing things. So that's, that's one way to go. Uh, and then what I'll add to it is of this, just a nice big, thick, fleecy buff, uh, that's loose. It's not tight. And when I put this on, it just kind of forms this little kind of a thicker barrier that kind of hangs out front. And if I'm going into the wind, I can pull it up. And then if I'm turning around going with the wind, I can pull it down, but it keeps my whole neck area even more insulated. Okay. So that works really well. Uh, and then the other option is, uh, again, be right back. <clears throat> if, uh, if you want to have an experience, uh, for example, today, I'm biking to work, 70 kilometer an hour wind, piercing skin shredding snow coming across my face and I can see it. I can see the, the sand blasting that's about to take my face off, but I've got goggles on and I'm like, oh, I'm just, I'm invincible. Now I could feel the wind, 
but none of my skin got peeled off at all because I'm wearing goggles. And so if you want to have a really comfortable experience, especially when it's windy, uh, um, get yourself a pair of goggles. They don't have to be fancy or good in any way, just goggles. And that feeling of your eyes, you can now open your eyes. You can see what's going on. The wind isn't piercing your eyeballs kind of makes you feel bulletproof out there and makes the experience um, awesome. So downhill skiers use goggles. And for some reason, people walking around the lake or going for a stroll outside uh, are just like toughing it out with their squinting eyes and the snow's pelting them in the face. Put some goggles on, boom. So it makes your whole body feel better. All right. Check the face. Oh, so um, some other options. And so I know this looks funny when you do it, but um, anything that's oil-based won't freeze. Oil doesn't freeze. Um, so you take something like a chapstick. And so, you know, you, we all use this on our lips 25 times a day in wintertime, right? But you can also take the chapstick um, and like color your face with it, right? And color your nose. And I found out now that if you get the actual stick that's like a lipstick, and you can actually, this sounds funny, but stick it up your nose and twirl it okay and then you get the chapstick on the inside of your nose so when you're breathing in the cold air um, the inside of your nose doesn't freeze so take your chapstick color your face with it um do a and then so so one of the one of the drawbacks to that is maybe it really affects your complexion um you get uh you know an acne outbreak or something like that so then okay that's not an option for you you're sticking with a buff that covers your face uh, another option is just good old fashioned Vaseline, smear some Vaseline on your face. Um, people ask me, well, what happened? Isn't that, isn't that messy? Like, aren't, doesn't your face end up all full of Vaseline? I'm like, no, when you come in after the run or the hike, it seems to go away. I don't know where it goes, but it evaporates or maybe it soaks in. I don't know. Sorry, I got some stuff popping up here. All right. So those are the tricks and how to uh, kind of protect the skin of your face. Uh, now, as I'm thinking about the Vaseline thing, I did hear, I was watching football on Sunday and, uh, where was the really cold game in the States? I think it was in Buffalo and, uh, the running back for the Patriots said that, uh, cause they're all out there in, in short sleeve shirts because you gotta be tough to play football, I guess. Like put a shirt on anyways. Uh, he would put Vaseline on his arms. I'm like, oh yeah, that's what we used to do. Um, that's super messy and gross, but <clears throat> It works for especially your feet. So not a lot of Vaseline, but take a little bit of Vaseline and just kind of like you're putting lotion on your feet, some Vaseline on your foot, and then pull your sock on or multiple pairs of socks. And that actually keeps your feet warmer because that layer of oil is an insulating layer and it, and it prevents you from uh, getting cold. So Vaseline is a trick. All right. Uh, if you're taking the chapstick and putting it up your nose, uh, Try not to do that where anybody's going to watch you because they will look at you funny when you do that. All right. Uh, <laughs> but if you're going outside in the minus 40, um, they're going to look at you funny anyways. Okay. Did I miss anything on there? No. Cool. All right. Uh, wet, weather tip number six. Get acclimated. Meaning go out there. Give it a shot. Don't go too far in case you freeze to death. Come back in. Go, whew. That was a three-minute walk. That was terrible. I'm going to try that again tomorrow, and maybe it'll be five minutes. So the way your body reacts to the cold uh, for most people is it's, well, it's worried about, so that inside part of your body that kind of determines heart rate and blood pressure, like the things that we don't control, um, <clears throat> that part of your body is kind of like the parent. And the rest of us who makes all sorts of decisions, like I'm going to go outside in the cold, that's kind of like the 15 year old or 13 year old in us, right? So it's like the parent and the kid. And sometimes the parent wonders if the kid is making good decisions. And sometimes the parent overreacts to like, this is dangerous. We got to shut this stuff down. So what happens when you go outside in the cold is your blood flows through your body. It goes out to places like your hands and feet, the blood cools, that blood goes back to the center of the body and there's temperature sensors in your body that says, whoa, that's really cold blood. 
Where did it come from? Well, it came from the hands. Okay, well, let's stop that because we don't want this cold blood to affect the heart and the brain and the lungs. And so the body can shut down, like turn off the tap and stop some blood from flowing to your hands and feet. Well, when that happens, that's when you get cold. Now I showed you how to counteract that by like pushing blood into your hands, but it would be nice if your body just opened up that tap a little bit and let the blood flow into your extremities. <clears throat> so we're talking about getting acclimated to the weather. So when October and November comes and it starts to get cold, our acclimation from last year is gone. Okay. We have to get reacclimated, which means go outside when it's cold, show your body that you're not just an irresponsible teenager that's going to die in the cold, that you actually know what you're doing. And as you expose yourself to cold more and more and more, the body is willing to open up these taps in your ankles and your wrists and the rest of your body to let blood flow out into your extremities. Okay. The key there is you're still moving, maybe not like running super fast, but you got to keep walking. You got to keep moving. You got to keep generating heat. So when that blood that comes back from your hand, which is cold, comes back into your body, it can mix with the hot blood that's coming from the working muscles. And now the body's like, okay, this is, this is safe. This, this person isn't putting themselves at risk. Um, I'm now willing to let blood go out to the extremities and keep them warm. All right. Uh, so one of the tricks uh, I forgot to mention with uh, how you're dressing is, you know, <clears throat> bundling up the arms and legs is not that important, but bundling up the core is. So you might wear shorts, but a vest, okay? The vest keeps the core hot. So all that hot blood can go to the extremities, keep things flowing. And when it comes back, it gets rewarmed uh, because you're wearing a vest. So that's why, that's the big thing with vests. Um, so you'll have, let's say, for example, the military in the North has a vest that's got heating elements and, and a charger. So you can turn the vest on because the people doing, let's say mechanical work on an airplane when it's minus 35, they're not jogging. They're not even that active. They're just turning wrenches, but they need hands. They can't use mitts, right? So you have this vest that gets super hot that heats the core blood and that lets them work outside in the cold with thin gloves or maybe even bare hands, okay? So get acclimated, expose yourself um, to the cold in small amounts in the beginning, right from the beginning of the winter, and then more and more and more. And you'll find out that, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, I'm surviving this. Uh, there's a professor from uh, uh, University of Manitoba. I honestly forget his real name, but he's known as Dr. Freeze. And uh, he, I was at a conference and he was talking about uh, measuring temperature, skin temperature with the person who is, who is acclimated to the cold versus not acclimated to the cold. So he goes up north uh, to, uh, to a, a northern community to study some people who have, have lived in the cold in that environment their whole life, and they acclimate to the conditions very well every fall and winter. And they appear to be, I, I guess, tougher than the rest of us Southerners, okay? Where they can be outside in the cold and they don't feel cold. So his question was, are they tougher or are they just warmer? And uh, so he puts temperature sensors on the skin and he and the fellow go outside in a t-shirt and it's minus 20 and they're just having a chat and they're measuring their skin temperature. Um, his skin temperature was much colder than the other fellow, the fellow that was born and raised in this, in this area and was very acclimated to the cold. He actually wasn't cold, he was warm. He wasn't tolerating the cold, he was simply comfortable because his body was willing to send blood to the surface and blood to his extremities to keep him warm, okay? So get acclimated, that's a huge, huge piece. All right, uh, oh, <clears throat> brought along, uh, so you, know, you might have heard of hot shots or hand warmers. Um, this is an option. The, uh, they come in, I, I guess I'm going to say two different versions. This is specifically a hand warmer. So it's a little, it's a little 
pocket of some sort of activated charcoal that when it exposes itself to air, um, it heats up. Uh, they also come in uh, flat versions that have a peel off sticky side and they're intent, so they're flat, they're not uh, thick and they're intended to go in your shoe. Um, of the two, I'm a big fan of the shoe ones, not a big fan of the hand ones. I just find if I go for a run for an hour with this charcoal thing in my mitt, uh, by the end of it, the charcoal is like busted open and now my hands are all black. And that just, that's gross. I hate that. Uh, but the foot ones are kind of plastic on one side and they cover my, they're my toes and they, uh, they act as a windbreaker and also they give me heat for my toes. So they actually work really well. Uh, what I do with the hand warmers, this might sound funny, but if I'm, do, if I'm at biathlon or if I'm just going to go for a run, um, uh, if I'm at home, I'll put my mitts on the register to warm them up before I go. But if I'm meeting someone somewhere and I've got my mitts in my bag, um, I'll take the hand warmers out of the package. I'll put them in my mitts and uh, pre-warm my mitts. So when I go to put my mitts on, I just chuck the hand warmers out, but now I have warm mitts. Um, so that's uh, how I like to use those. One of the things with these, I will tell you, is that they do take some time to get warm. So the mistake you can make with this is take them out, put them in your mitt, and go outside. And you'll wonder why they're not heating up. Well, they take about half an hour to actually kind of chemically get activated. So, so uh, if you're going to do that, like unwrap them, I'll, uh, I'll usually wear two pairs of socks if I'm going hiking or running outside. So I'll put, a, I'll put a thin pair of socks on. I'll stick the thing on top. I'll put my other pair of socks on. And then I'll walk around the house for a while and finish my coffee or whatever. Let them heat. And then I'll put my shoes on and go. Okay. That brings up the topic of socks and shoes. So like I said, I'll wear two pairs of socks. Thin, thin socks. Because they're my regular running shoes. And the mistake people make is I'm going to wear extra socks to keep my feet extra warm. What happens then is if you have your regular shoe on, now the shoe's tight, that tight shoe restricts blood flow, and now your feet are going to freeze. So things can't be tight on your hands or your feet. They have to be at a normal tension level. Okay. Um, uh, trick for, uh, I'd say going for a run in your running shoes and your summer running shoes that are made for ventilation. There's tons of holes in it, right? Um, is just take duct tape and tape over the toe box. Just put a piece of duct tape over the top of your shoe. Um, that prevents the wind from going through and the duct tape might last for two or three or five runs and you can just, it falls off, you put a new piece on. That's how you use your regular running shoes uh, for uh, an outside run when it's really cold, okay? Uh, when it comes to footwear and stability and sliding, the, some people like to put the, the, the kind of a rubbery, rubbery thing that kind of pulls over your shoe and it, it has some spikes on it, okay? Those can work well, depending on the conditions. Uh, if it's really icy and slippery, they work well. Uh, they do have a drawback. If you end up running down a, a clean, well-shoveled sidewalk, clean concrete that's also frozen those little spikes are almost worse than a shoe and now they're really slippery on the clean concrete so there's pros and cons to those things okay all right i got through my weather uh, my six tips uh let me just see i had some <clears throat> got another list here of things that uh that i thought were interesting oh so yeah i talked about base layer i didn't talk about the other two layers all right so base layer is really important then there's the second layer. We'll get to that. The third layer or the outer layer, the outer layer should be some sort of windproof type something. It might just be a thin nylon shell that's just windproof, or maybe it has some thickness to it, like a jacket, but it should have some degree of windproofness to it. Uh, now, if it's a full-on like rain jacket that's designed to keep out the rain, that's not going to breathe well enough for winter. You're going to, you're going to get wet pretty quickly on the inside um, if you're doing any sort of activity at all. So something that's that windproof, 
sometimes isn't great, but some windproofness to it works well. All right, base layer, outer windproof layer. And now depending on the temperature, you're gonna play with uh, insulating layers, okay? An insulating layer might just be another layer of like more base layer stuff that you've got, just that second layer. Or it might be something with a little bit more thickness, okay? <clears throat> Again, be right back. I thought, uh, oh, I better bring some examples of all my stuff. And I realized, well, I bike here, so I've got all my stuff with me. So these are just like super cozy fleece pants, right? Or they're just, they're like as thick as a thin sweater, but they're fleecy. So just polyester, um, but they're really good at that insulation piece, preventing air from flowing around, right? And so they're nice and fuzzy and cozy, and they make me happy when I put them on in the morning, make me feel like I'm going to make it. Um, if it gets colder, I'll just add another something like that to that inside between the base layer and that uh, windproof layer. That's how you kind of build it. Um, and you know, what you find is maybe you don't need it on top and bottom, okay? Maybe at minus 20, just the top works, and that keeps your whole body warm. But at minus 30, you know what? Adding the layer to the legs then keeps everything else warm, right? And you never even need to change what you have with your hands. So uh, that's the that's that the mid layer how to dress. <clears throat> I will say this: the the really big heavy winter parkas that sometimes we kind of navigate towards can sometimes not work at all. I have one really thick designed for minus 40 and any weather possible it's one size too big it's one size too big and i am cold in that thing constantly it's in my son's the trunk of his car as an emergency jacket you know in case you get stuck in the ditch you can use it as a blanket uh, it's a beautiful north face jacket um, it's probably one of those really expensive things and it's just i'm cold in it all the time because it's just a little too big lets the air flow too much and then I freeze, okay? All right. Hmm. I think I got all the stuff I wanted to tell you about. So uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me on this uh, how to dress for weather. And uh, this, uh, you, you may be, if you're watching this uh, as a recording, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you're watching it on YouTube, so thanks for watching that. That's where this is going afterwards, onto our SAS Polytech Fit and Rec page on YouTube. So thank you very much.